Benediction Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Benediction by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part Two. Chapter Three. Back in the reception room, Lois met a half dozen more of Keith's particular friends. There was a young man named Jarvis, rather pale and delicate looking, who, she knew, must be a grandson of old Mrs. Jarvis at home, and she mentally compared this ascetic with a brace of his riotous uncles. And there was Regan with a scarred face and piercing, intent eyes that followed her about the room, and often rested on Keith with something very like worship. She knew then what Keith had meant about a good man to have with you in a fight. He's the missionary type, she thought vaguely. China or something. I want Keith's sister to show us what the shimmy is, demanded one young man with a broad grin. Lois laughed. I'm afraid the father rector would send me shimmying out the gate. Besides, I'm not an expert. I'm sure it wouldn't be best for Jimmy's soul anyway said Keith solemnly. He's inclined to brood about things like shimmies. They were just starting to do the Maxiques, wasn't it, Jimmy, when he became a monk, and it haunted him his whole first year. You'd see him when he was peeling potatoes, putting his arm around the bucket, and making irreligious motions with his feet. There was a general laugh in which Lois joined. An old lady who comes here to Mass sent Keith this ice cream, whispered Jarvis under cover of the laugh because she'd heard you were coming. It's pretty good, isn't it? There were tears trembling in Lois's eyes. Chapter 4 Then, half an hour later, over in the chapel, things suddenly went all wrong. It was several years since Lois had been at benediction, and at first she was thrilled by the gleaming monstrance with its central spot of white, the air rich and heavy with incense and the sun shining through the stained-glass window of St. Francis Xavier overhead, and falling in warm red tracery on the cassock of the man in front of her. But at the first notes of the O Salutaris Hostia, a heavy weight seemed to descend upon her soul. Keith was on her right, and young Jarvis on her left, and she stole uneasy glances at both of them. "'What's the matter with me?' she thought impatiently. She looked again. Was there a certain coldness in both their profiles that she had not noticed before? A pallor about the mouth, and a curious set expression in their eyes. She shivered slightly. They were like dead men. She felt her soul recede suddenly from Keith's. This was her brother, this, this unnatural person. She caught herself in the act of a little laugh. What is the matter with me? She passed her hand over her eyes, and the weight increased. The incense sickened her, and a stray, ragged note from one of the tenors in the choir grated on her ear like the shriek of a slate pencil. She fidgeted, and raising her hand to her hair, touched her forehead, found moisture on it. It's hot in here, hot as the deuce. Again she repressed a faint laugh and then in an instant the weight upon her heart suddenly diffused into cold fear. It was that candle on the altar. It was all wrong, wrong. Why didn't somebody see it? There was something in it. There was something coming out of it, taking form and shape above it. She tried to fight down her rising panic, told herself it was the wick. If the wick wasn't straight, candles did something. But they didn't do this. With incalculable rapidity, a force was gathering within her, a tremendous, assimilative force, drawing from every sense, every corner of her brain, and as it surged up inside her, she felt an enormous, terrified repulsion. She drew her arms in close to her side, away from Keith and Jarvis. Something in that candle. She was leaning forward. In another moment, she felt she would go forward toward it. Didn't anyone see it? Anyone? Ugh! She felt a space beside her, and something told her that Jarvis had gasped and sat down very suddenly. Then she was kneeling, and as the flaming monstrance slowly left the altar in the hands of the priest, she heard a great rushing noise in her ears, 
the crash of the bells was like hammer blows and then in a moment that seemed eternal a great torrent rolled over her heart there was a shouting there and a lashing as of waves she was calling felt herself calling for keith her lips mouthing the words that would not come keith oh my god keith Suddenly she became aware of a new presence, something external, in front of her, consummated and expressed in warm red tracery. Then she knew. It was the window of St. Francis Xavier. Her mind gripped at it, clung to it finally, and she felt herself calling again endlessly, impotently, Keith! Keith! Then out of a great stillness came a voice. Blessed be God! With a gradual rumble sounded the response, rolling heavily through the chapel. Blessed be God! The words sang instantly in her heart. The incense lay mystically and sweetly peaceful upon the air. And the candle on the altar went out. Blessed be his holy name! Blessed be his holy name! Everything blurred into a swinging mist. With a sound, half gasp, half cry, she rocked on her feet and reeled backward into Keith's suddenly outstretched arms. Chapter 5 Lie still, child. She closed her eyes again. She was on the grass outside, pillowed on Keith's arm, and Regan was dabbing her head with a cold towel. I'm all right, she said quietly. I know, but just lie still a minute longer. It was too hot in there. Jarvis felt it, too. She laughed as Regan again touched her gingerly with the towel. I'm all right, she repeated. But though a warm peace was filling her mind and heart, she felt oddly broken and chastened, as if someone had held her stripped soul up and laughed. Chapter 6 Half an hour later, she walked, leaning on Keith's arm, down the long central path toward the gate. "'It's been such a short afternoon,' he sighed. "'And I'm so sorry you were sick, Lois.' "'Keith, I'm feeling fine now, really. I wish you wouldn't worry.' "'Poor old child. I didn't realize that benediction would be a long service for you, after your hot trip out here and all.' She laughed cheerfully. I guess the truth is I'm not much used to benediction. Mass is the limit of my religious exertions. She paused and then continued quickly. I don't want to shock you, Keith, but I can't tell you how, how inconvenient being a Catholic is. It really doesn't seem to apply any more. As far as morals go, some of the wildest boys I know are Catholics. And the brightest boys, I mean the ones who think and read a lot, don't seem to believe in much of anything any more. Tell me about it. The bus won't be here for another half hour. They sat down on a bench by the path. For instance, Gerald Carter, he's published a novel. He absolutely roars when people mention immortality. And then how, well, another man I've known well, lately, who was Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard, says that no intelligent person can believe in supernatural Christianity. He says Christ was a great socialist, though. Am I shocking you? She broke off suddenly. Keith smiled. You can't shock a monk. He's a professional shock absorber. Well, she continued, that's about all. It seems so, so narrow. Church schools, for instance. There's more freedom about things that Catholic people can't see like birth control. Keith winced, almost imperceptibly, but Lois saw it. Oh, she said quickly, everybody talks about everything now. It's probably better that way. Oh, yes, much better. Well, that's all, Keith. I just wanted to tell you why I'm a little lukewarm at present. I'm not shocked, Lois. I understand better than you think. We all go through those times. But I know it'll come out all right, child. There's that gift of faith that we have, you and I, that'll carry us past the bad spots. He rose as he spoke, and they started again down the path. I want you to pray for me sometimes, Lois. 
I think your prayers would be about what I need, because we've come very close in these few hours, I think. Her eyes were suddenly shining. Oh, we have, we have, she cried. I feel closer to you now than to anyone in the world. He stopped suddenly and indicated the side of the path. We might, just a minute. It was a pieta, a life-size statue of the Blessed Virgin, set within a semicircle of rocks. Feeling a little self-conscious, she dropped on her knees beside him and made an unsuccessful attempt at prayer. She was only half through when he rose. He took her arm again. I wanted to thank her for letting us have this day together, he said simply. Lois felt a sudden lump in her throat, and she wanted to say something that would tell him how much it had meant to her, too, but she found no words. I'll always remember this, he continued, his voice trembling a little. This summer day with you. It's been just what I expected. You're just what I expected, Lois. I'm awfully glad, Keith. You see, when you were little, they kept sending me snapshots of you, first as a baby, and then as a child in socks, playing on the beach with a pail and shovel, and then suddenly as a wistful little girl with wondering, pure eyes. And I used to build dreams about you. A man has to have something living to cling to. I think, Lois, it was your little white soul I tried to keep near me, even when life was at its loudest, and every intellectual idea of God seemed the sheerest mockery, and desire and love and a million things came up to me and said, Look here at me. See, I'm life. You're turning your back on it. All the way through that shadow, Lois, I could always see your baby soul flitting on ahead of me, very frail and clear and wonderful. Lois was crying softly. They had reached the gate, and she rested her elbow on it and dabbed furiously at her eyes. And then later, child, when you were sick, I knelt all one night and asked God to spare you for me, for I knew then that I wanted more. He had taught me to want more. I wanted to know you moved and breathed in the same world with me. I saw you growing up, that white innocence of yours changing to a flame and burning to give light to other weaker souls. And then I wanted some day to take your children on my knee and hear them call the crabbed old monk Uncle Keith. He seemed to be laughing now as he talked. Oh, Lois, Lois, I was asking God for more then. I wanted the letters you'd write me and the place I'd have at your table. I wanted an awful lot, Lois, dear. You've got me, Keith, she sobbed. You know it. Say you know it. Oh, I'm acting like a baby, but I didn't think you'd be this way, and I... Oh, Keith, Keith... He took her hand and patted it softly. Here's the bus. You'll come again, won't you? She put her hands on his cheeks, and drawing his head down, pressed her tear-wet face against his. Oh, Keith, brother, some day I'll tell you something. He helped her in, saw her take down her handkerchief, and smile bravely at him as the driver flicked his whip and the bus rolled off. Then a thick cloud of dust rose around it, and she was gone. For a few minutes he stood there on the road, his hand on the gatepost, his lips half parted in a smile. Lois, he said aloud in a sort of wonder. Lois, Lois. Later, some probationers passing noticed him kneeling before the Pieta, and coming back after a time found him still there and he was there until twilight came down, and the courteous trees grew garrulous overhead, and the crickets took up their burden of song in the dusky grass. Chapter 7 The first clerk in the telegraph booth in the Baltimore station whistled through his buck teeth at the second clerk. What's the matter? See that girl? No, the pretty one, with the big black dots on her veil. Too late. She's gone. You missed some. What about her? Nothing, except she's damn good looking. Came in here yesterday and sent a wire to some guy to meet her somewhere. Then a minute ago she came in with a telegram, all written out, 
and was standing there going to give it to me, when she changed her mind or something, and all of a sudden tore it up. Hmm. The first clerk came around the counter, and picking up the two pieces of paper from the floor, put them together idly. The second clerk read them over his shoulder, and subconsciously counted the words as he read. There were just thirteen. This is in the way of a permanent good-bye. I should suggest Italy. Lois. Tore it up, eh? said the second clerk. End of Benediction by F. Scott Fitzgerald